Good afternoon. I hope you had a, a good lunch break. Um, I try to not be too boring, actually, <laughs> to keep you awake. Um, today I'm going to present um, the way we use MySQL uh, um, in a data warehousing environment. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to know who's using MySQL in a data warehouse project. Okay. Who's using 5.1? Okay, 5.0. All right. Uh, last question on storage engines, specifically for data warehousing. Who's using InnoDB? MyISM? Any other engine? Okay. Anybody else? All right. Okay. What I'm going to present today is, uh, well, first of all, of course, a quick intro and um, um, a quick overview of what I define as a collision of two words. You'll see what I mean in a, in a few minutes. And then uh, we'll cover a little bit of, uh, of the data warehousing terminology, uh, just a few, a couple of minutes, but just to be, you know, everybody on the same round here. And then uh, we, will, uh, we will cover the main topics. Uh, um, and we'll talk about the strategies for uh, uh, data warehousing and online analytical processing with MySQL. And, uh, um, well, more than a cookbook, I would, I would call these best practices on how to use MySQL in a data warehousing environment. So I hope that uh, you will find some interesting ideas for your projects if, you, if you're already using MySQL or if you are considering to use MySQL in a data warehousing environment. And then we will cover a little bit of the benchmarks, uh, uh, but you'll see what I mean with really, really at the end of the presentation. Um, first of all, as I said, a little bit of introduction. My name is Ivan Zorati, I'm the, um, the sales uh, consulting manager for EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Sales consulting, or if you want, uh, pre-sales or sales engineers we've been called in, uh, in our previous life um, at Oracle MySQL. Uh, this is our team, um, so I cover as I said, I will lead the team here. Yeah, we have some of the SCs here, by the way. Um, my counterpart for uh, Asia, Pacific, and, uh, and Americas is uh, Philip Antoniades. So if you are, and he's there, he's sitting there. So if you are a, a, a MySQL customer, you may, you may talk to them, or, may, or you may have already talked to them. And uh, you can, of course, refer to them for more information. Let's start with the main topics here. Um, as I said, I call this first uh, uh, section the collision of two words because uh, uh, what I have in mind, uh, based on my on my past experience in data warehousing environment with other databases, mainly Oracle and Formix, is the fact that uh, we have two different words colliding to some extent. On one side, if we can move sides, on one side we have a typical enterprise environment where everything is pretty much well defined. There are you know, database administrators and database architects. Um, we rely on pretty large servers. We have lots of cache and memory available. Uh, we use uh, commercial databases, and one of the main topics here in data warehousing is uh, the use of parallel queries or advanced partitioning techniques, etc. And uh, again, generally speaking, the storage is, um, is mainly shared, it's mainly shared storage. On the other side, uh, I would say this is the typical MySQL environment where we have a, a well, not so well-defined environments and uh, we have DBAs and software developers and sometimes uh, we are talking about the same person here. We rely on commodity servers. Resources are in general, they are limited in size and memory. Uh, and we have a different, completely different approach. We use sharding, we use replication. That's mainly used for OTP applications and web applications, but nothing stops us from using this for, uh, for data housing as well. And you will see what I mean in one of the sections that I'm going to present. And uh, again, as a common practice, internal storage is preferred to share storage. Uh, there's no, it's not a big deal for us, but uh, in general, what we found is more internal storage and share storage. So just to expand this idea, uh, the enterprise approach is more organized, where there are organized systems, and uh, you, may, you may find OTP systems, and then 
uh, data is moved to operational data stores and data warehouses. There will be data marts and reporting service, etc. Uh, there are organized tools, all sorts of tools that you may use uh, for um, uh, extracting, transforming, and loading the data, um, for reporting, for a typical business intelligence and, uh, and um, analytics. Uh, uh, roles are more organized, so again, database administrators and data architects uh, uh, are different from software developers. We have data analysts, power users who are really um, digging into the data and they know exactly what, uh, what they can get from, uh, from the data. Sometimes they, they know SQL and they, they, they use SQL statement directly. And the data is organized and that's the most important aspect. So um, there are some specific models that are designed for, uh, for uh, business needs. Uh, they may be, may be normalized or normalized, or they have different schemes. The, what I call the web approach, and not because the web is not organized, but because uh, um, this is a typical, uh, uh, I would say, startup mode. And, uh, and the web is uh, mainly the, 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 the home for startup. Um, Companies is uh, is a, a continuous beta testing and growing and growing environment where um, the new systems come when there are more needs and you start with the core business and then you move on and only when you have uh, you have fixed your uh, your first version what you know to fulfill your first needs and uh, provide the core business then you move on and you provide um, a data warehouse environment uh, and uh, then you can use new tools etc. And just to go quickly from one slide to another, then of course roles change. We start with uh, uh, maybe some developers providing reporting, and then, the, then we move on, and we have um, we, we have more specific roles and data. So we may just summarize this with uh, with uh, five stages where. Uh, uh, initially, we are focused on our core business. There are no needs of uh, reporting and data warehousing unless, of course, reporting and data warehousing is not our core business. So, um, in general, here, we, we just don't have anything to report. Then, uh, we, we move to a second stage where there are more reporting needs. And in this case, um, generally speaking, reports run on the same service where you have OTP applications. Uh, at some point, these reports become um, heavy and uh, you can't go on and running them on that. Or you have multiple systems, so you need to consolidate your data and uh, you end up with uh, real business intelligence and advanced analysis where you have business users who know exactly or you should know what, they, what they're looking for and that they require more sophisticated analysis. So very quickly, uh, before, uh, uh, let's say, digging into the, 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 the main aspects of uh, MySQL and the data warehousing environment, uh, um, let's just say, okay, first of all, when we talk about, about data warehousing, we refer to uh, a term that has different meanings. Uh, I'd like to identify this as just a, you know, a generic collection of systems that are, uh, and data that is designed to provide information for all sorts of reporting, business intelligence, and decision support. Uh, for uh, online analytical processing, um, we, we, we can define it as pretty much the opposite of online transaction processing. But what is really important is that with MySQL, we rely on the a specific roll-up approach. So it's a, re it's a relational only analytical processing. Um, opposite to some, uh, some commercial products where you have a mix of uh, multi-dimensional environment, multi-dimensional extensions. This is not the MySQL way. MySQL, whether, it's, uh, whether you use the, just the standard storage engines or you want to use uh, some columnar engine from, uh, from third parties, you still use a relational online analytical process. So it's a relational approach. It's a standard SQL and uh, it's a standard uh, uh, use of, uh, of, uh, of SQL statement at the database server. Now, the common cases we, we have seen, and uh, perhaps you may identify some of your projects in one of these, uh, of these uh, five cases, are uh, MySQL used in a typical data mart environment. So you have your large data warehouse uh, in an enterprise, and uh, maybe a data warehouse based on uh, 
another commercial database, and, uh, and you use MySQL for data maps. Why? Because it fits perfectly. It's, uh, you, know, you, can, you can really install everything in a few minutes on a, on a Linux box, you load the data, and you're ready to go with, uh, with uh, your favorite tool for, ana for uh, analyzing data. Um, more specifically, you may, you may find um, what we call real-time data warehousing, where basically data is uh, stored constantly in real time. So that, that is a little bit different from the typical data warehousing environment where you take the data, you extract, transform, and load it, and only when it's loaded you certify this data and then you can start analyzing it with it. In this case, you have a constant load, and of course, this implies more uh, challenges in a way you want to certify the data, you, you want to define some specific snapshots, and you can have a, a clear view of your, uh, of, your, uh, of your data available. Reporting is another, is another environment that is uh, relatively simple. So you have, uh, you have your OTP applications, you just copy the data from one, from one server or from multiple servers into other servers, and then you start reporting data. Uh, I would say that with these three uh, common cases, we cover pretty much 80% of the data warehousing environment we can see in the field as a, as a sales consultant. So, uh, we can find pretty much this, uh, this kind of approaches. Then there are, let's say, some uh, less, uh, um, let's say, uh, less evident approaches for, for MySQL where we, we store historical data. And, uh, and this is uh, typically useful uh, when we collect logs and then we store the, these logs into compressed formats. Um, we mentioned the archive uh, storage engine, and that of course comes handy in this case. But there are many others, as I said, that we, we, we can mention the use of a, a, a third party engines here that work pretty well in, 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 uh, in historical. Uh, data warehouses, and uh, a more sophisticated and analytical environment. But here I would say we really um, crunch against uh, uh, what, we, what we may define as the standard uh, uh, data warehousing approach that is more a territory for uh, more uh, complex uh, and uh, large environments with databases like Oracle and Shields. But still, there are definitely uh, um, situations where we have seen um, happy users uh, of MySQL also in this particular environment. So, from a, a MySQL perspective, based on these common cases, let's dig a little bit more into what we can find and how we can, uh, we can actually use MySQL in this environment. This is a snapshot of a, of a typical ecosystem for data warehousing for MySQL. Um, I'm not saying that it's exhaustive, I'm not saying that uh, you can find only this, uh, products on the market, but it's, I think it's a good combination of the products that we usually find. Uh, it's a mix of commercial and uh, open source products. Uh, uh, we have divided them in three main elements, as you can see on the ETL side and the integration side on, on the other hand, and the typical BI and reporting tools in the middle. Yep? So, it may sound really funny and strange, but the one thing I'm, I'm just in this slide is Excel. It is, don't you? <laughs> yes, it is. As I said, it's not exhaustive. I mean, you may, but you are absolutely right. Uh, Microsoft Excel is uh, number one reporting tool yeah, if you want. Yeah, that's why. yeah absolutely. As uh, as you may have, uh, like Access is another example. For that. Yeah, absolutely. But <clears throat> again, what you see here are, uh, to some extent, I would say, partners and third parties and community. Um, contributors and, uh, and um, open source company, uh, and we find them pretty often in, uh, in, uh, in a MySQL environment. Now, if you wonder, perhaps you already know this very well, but uh, the difference between the ETL side here and the integration side, uh, in the way we wanted to show this slide, is the fact that here we have a specific workflow where we extract the data, we transform it in some way, and then we load it into the into a data warehouse, here we have a constant integration, a sort of constant replication or uh, data that moves constantly from one side to another or from multiple sources to another. So, um, talent, often a, talent you, uh, offers a, a, an open source solution. It can be commercial or non-commercial. Uh, as you may know, Informatica, of course, offers a, a, 
a, a, a typical commercial solution. On the integration side, we have its software there up there, and Oracle with Golden Gate, um, usually, a of course, a, co a commercial solution continuum offers a mix. It's open source or, um, or uh, commercial again. In, in the middle, you have, uh, well, just again, as I said, a subset of uh, useful BI and reporting tools that are certified with MySQL. Um, some of them are commercial, some are, are not. Uh, they are both commercial and open source. Um, I would say, don't ask me which one is the best one, because of course uh, it depends, it depends on your needs. They work all pretty well with MySQL. Uh, we don't have many, many issues in general with these products, okay? Apart from standard bugs that you may find in any software. Um, in the middle, of course, the core is MySQL, is our database. And you may find some other storage engines. Here I just mentioned storage engines that are not part of the standard MySQL, uh, uh, MySQL product. So uh, TopDB or InfoBright and InfinityDB are definitely great storage engines for data housing. Um, of course, they have, uh, they have their own uh, pros and cons. There, are, there is a great advantage in using using one of these storage engines, there may be also some disadvantages. I'm not going to talk about this because, of course, you may, you may find them in, uh, at the pavilion, so you may go and stop there and ask at their booth uh, what they can provide. Uh, I would say, in general, they are very, very good, very helpful. So uh, I think, I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's good to evaluate, if you have a, a, a data warehousing project, to evaluate also the use of these storage engines as an option. And in terms of platforms, uh, okay, let's say Kickfire is a little bit the outsider here because it's a hardware appliance, uh, mainly focused on data warehousing, and uh, uh, we work pretty well on every platform. Here's a point which is quite important. You may have he you may have heard on other se in other sessions that MySQL may work well with, uh, with Linux uh, and not that it's not that good, or it may be work. Um, with less performance on Windows, etc. Okay, now bear in mind that with, with the data warehousing project, things are slightly different. We have, uh, we have more heavy, we have less queries, but they are heavier. And uh, we have a different uh, way to interact with the server. We have less rounds through the network. Um, so what you may see as a behavior in a Linux or a Windows environment, in a typical web application may be completely different from what you see in a, in a data warehouse application. I'm not saying that you will see a significant performance boost. What I'm saying is that the platform doesn't really make a big difference in terms of a software operating system. It's more on the hardware that you can put in it and, first of all, the way you model and you design your solution. So, uh, if we expand the, um, the MySQL rectangle you found there, uh, we can see the technologies that really come handy when you use a data warehousing solution um, with MySQL. Uh, the idea of the multiple storage engine is just fantastic because you can use storage engines for different poses, and that, there is a slide that represents this. But Again, generally speaking, InnoDB, MyEyesom, Archive, the federated engines, CSV, they all come handy. Somebody may say, well, the federated is not that great. Yeah, I agree with you, there are some issues. But guess what? Again, it's a different environment. It's not a typical OTP. If you know what is missing in a federated engine, you may also know that it can be really, really good when you, when you just use a specific heavy query and you just need to interact in a specific way with the, with the network apps you buy. Caching, uh, apart from the typical key buffer, the buffer pool, depending on uh, the storage engine you use, query cache and memcached can be very, very helpful. Again, query cache, you may have heard, query cache is great, but there are some locking issues. Again, less queries, less locking issues here. It may be very, very helpful when you, when you use, uh, specifically when you use lookups, and uh, you can store lookups immediately on the, on the query cache and you can get them immediately. So that's another important point. Partitioning, of course, when you have large type tables, partitioning is one of the most important aspects to consider. Active-active service, we share storage. 
this is one of the, let's say, hidden gems we have. Um, it's been around for years and years. Uh, the objective was different, but uh, with data warehousing solution, this is quite interesting, I would say. And again, I will, I will talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes. And then again, replication in Sharp. So, just to map what I showed you before and, uh, and uh, the different technologies that we have, uh, that I just presented in this slide. Uh, let's say, in general, for data mass, everything works pretty much well. Um, I've just uh, grayed here the active active service and archive because they really don't fit that much with, uh, with uh, a typical data mark. But again, this is a just, a, just a, a, a guideline. I'm not saying that you should just ign you should ignore this completely. Um, in a, in a real-time engine, then InnoDB can play a significant role because, of course, we have row-level uh, row locking and not table-level locking. The federated engine and the CSV just to constantly load information. CSV is fantastic in a way you can just take, touch a file, a CSV file and load it or uh, access to it very, very easily. And then cache the uh, replication and sharding. Again, as I said, in the, in the cookbook, you, you will see a little bit of, you know, a few examples of this. Reporting, we got pretty much everything because reporting is more generic. So uh, again, we have, uh, we have all sorts of different technologies we can use. And the same is for historical and analytical engines. So here, we just grade a little bit the, 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 the archive of the federated because uh, it may be more specific on, uh, on uh, the typical BI environment where um, indexing is very important and federated and dark are not good at all with indexing as you as you may already know. Right. So um, let's dig into into the real the, the details of what we can do with uh, with MySQL and a specific approach to some of the real issues or uh, problems you want to you want to tackle. Uh, first of all, you may know uh, the typical uh, modeling you may use with, uh, with, uh, um, in a data warehousing environment uh, refers, uh, generally speaking, to one of these two schemes, a star scheme or a snowflake scheme. It's the way we uh, design the tables and we relay the tables. With a fact table in the middle, okay, here we have simplified, we have only one fact table, so maybe many, of course. Um, <coughs> So star schema is fine if you have dimensions uh, with uh, relatively few rows, few values. If you have only a few thousand values, then a star schema might be fine, might be really, really good. And when I, when I refer to a star schema, here we have a complete denormalization. So you have a primary key that is the attribute dimension that goes against the, the, the you know, it can be joined with the fact. But here, if we have a, like a hierarchy, we compress and we compact with this hierarchy in a single table. So we denormalize and duplicate descriptions and keys of the higher, higher elements. Um, good. It can be a good way to reduce the number of uh, tables and reduce the number of joints we're making. But there is a big problem here. If we have a, a huge number or a relatively large number of rows and values, we are, we are going to use the cache for uh, something that is not that useful because we are caching data that we are not using. So it may be interesting to have a mix or let's say move to something a little bit different like a snow scheme, a snowflake scheme. In a snowflake schema, we denormalize things in a way where basically we replicate the keys but the descriptions uh, stay in uh, their, let's say, in their main table. So if we have a, if we have a dimension with a three, in a hierarchy with three elements, um, three attributes, sorry, uh, we can have like a, a copied key on the, on, the, on the lowest value here, on the lowest table, uh, but not the description. We retrieve the description later without um, affecting in any way the cache and uh, you know, adding more, more data into the cache. And again, this is down to the fact that we have, uh, we have less resources. We don't have a huge amount of memory to use. We want to use it properly. And that's, that's the way we may do it. 
So just to give you an example, in a, in a very basic um, structure with orders as fact tables and only four dimensions, customers, geography, product, and, and time. Now let's expand the customers dimension with a, a fairly simple um, <coughs> hierarchy here with a customer but, and then a, a, a hierarchy based on city, state, region, and country and a few other attributes you can find to a customer. Supposing we have a few millions of customers, not, not, we are not talking about billions of rows, but let's say one million customers. Right, if we, if we keep this structure normalized, then we may have a, a customer's table with a, with a foreign key on the customer city, the customer city table will have, of course, a foreign, city, a foreign key on state, and so on on region, and region on country ID. Okay? Fairly simple. And this is a typical normalized environment. So if you need to uh, re uh, create a report uh, and you want to group your data by country, then, oh, all right. Okay, you have to join all the tables up to the region. And that would be pretty much a nightmare for uh, you know, we were talking about, let's say, one million customers. Or uh, in this example, we, we want to group, this is like where we want to group uh, by customer region. So again, we have, uh, we have uh, to join three tables up to the customer state where we can actually find, find the foreign key for customer region. Right. By using a, a typical snowflake schema, what we can do, and, uh, and if you follow me at this point, we just work with the primary keys and then we will move to the idea of the, of the descriptions uh, and how to retrieve the descriptions. What we can do, we can just stop to orders and customers and we can get the data directly from there. And when, so if you have to group people and customers uh, from uh, uh, the customer by customer region, we can find the customer region ID immediately here. So we skip the two other tables and of course we reduce the number of joins. Which is fine, we are very happy for that, but we have, we have something missing. Okay, we have the ID, we don't have the description. And of course, users want to see a description, they don't want to see a useless number. So another aspect that is very, very important uh, with, uh, um, with uh, MySQL is uh, to avoid complex queries in a way where, uh, for example, this is uh, uh, just uh, a, a, the output from uh, a BI tool that I just used as a, you know, to, 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 to grab some examples. Uh, it creates how many joints here and sub -quays? Well, forget about the number of joints. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to count them. But you see that there are two sub here and the third query in total. Okay. Now, I ran an explain on this, and I found out that basically the explain, the explain output is uh, 20 rows set, and uh, it is explained in 27 seconds. So there is something that is not really good. If you just create, oops. If you expand this and you create three queries, and then you you link them through temporary tables manually, you end up with something that is completely different. The explain is executed in 3.8 milliseconds, and that's the same, of course, for, uh, for, the, for the output, apart from the, 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 the effective calculation, but if you profile the queries, you reduce the number of seconds and milliseconds to, to, this, to this good number. And uh, there are some interesting side effects. So, the queries are more likely to be found in the query cache, so they are immediately available. You don't need to run them again and again. Uh, you can use memcached. We will see later what I mean, but you can just apply a typical uh, key value approach, and you can find this uh, information directly into memcached uh, into memcached server. And of course, uh, the buffer pool and the key and the key buffer is uh, is more efficient. They are more efficient. And you can also replicate this data. It's they are, this, these queries are more, let's say, replication friendly. And again, I have a, a couple of slides where you can, uh, you, can find, uh, you can find what I mean here. So 
The key point here is reduce the complexity of the query and apply a multipass SQL. You take your large statement and you, you basically split it into multiple SQL systems. The result is that you have less joints and the, the, optim the optimization of course uh, is, it, is improved. You have faster queries that can be cached more and better. They can be spread on shards or, or on replicas and you can bypass some of the current limitations we have with subqueries if you, if you are a little bit aware of this of course you may, you may know that we have some issues with subqueries. Um, there are some cons, of course, some disadvantages on the fact that you need to control this. So sometimes you cannot apply this automatically because the BI tool is creating the query for you and you cannot, uh, you cannot tweak it. So that may be difficult. And you have to use some temporary structure. So you have to be careful with the temporary tables uh, and some parameters that govern the, 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 the temporary tables as well. Well, yeah. that, does that actually mean that, that this approach you can only use it for if you really use like if you want to do standard reporting when you have control of the queries or is there some effect to the queries to be put? Right. If you have full control of the of the SQL you're generating, then you're fine. Of course, you can you can apply all these uh, yeah. aspects absolutely. If there is a tool that creates the SQL for you, then it depends on the tool. Some tools are, uh, can be tweaked in, some, in a way where you can write your own queries or you can force the tool uh, to, to do that. Or some tools are already focused on multi on multi-pass SQL. Some of the tools are, are like that, but not all of them. That's the problem. So it depends on the tool. The, the point here is, uh, if you're going to use MySQL in a data warehouse environment, you should consider this aspect. And this aspect is also very important if you are, if you are looking for the right tool. You should try it, you should test it, and see if you can do this thing. Will you um, return this point and, and, uh, later on and name a few tools? Which no, I, have, I haven't uh, mapped this to the tool, so uh, perhaps we can discuss it. Yes, Right? Right. Second aspect, or another aspect, is quite important, uh, and it's partitioning. Partitioning one of the, is one of the key points for, uh, for data warehousing. Um, and here, okay, first of all, just a reminder on uh, what we can do with partitioning in 5.1 and in 5.5 as well. Um, so, with 5.1, we have up to 1,024 partitions. Uh, we can partition by range list, hash key, etc. We can have sub-partitions uh, and so on. With 5.5, we, uh, we can expand this to uh, a partition key that is known integer, and we can define also some list of values and expressions. Uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe is here. He, he has written a, a, a very good uh, um, article on, on uh, the news on the new partitioning um, features in 5.5, so you can find it on, uh, on our website. Let's mention also that we have two types of partitioning here. So what we refer when we, when we talk about MySQL partitioning in the database uh, is, uh, mainly related to, is, is related to horizontal partitioning, where we have one table, and logically it's one table, but physically we split this table in multiple files or multiple elements. But we can also refer to the use of vertical partitioning, which is absolutely important, again, for a, for a, a performance improvement, where we split, vertically split the table. So we, we have columns split into two or more set of tables. And again, I have an example related to this. As usual, pros and cons, in using partitioning, it's not all uh, just uh, uh, fantastic and just roses. We also have uh, uh, some issues here. Uh, with partitioning, we have a, a fast insert mechanism. So when you insert data uh, with uh, you know with uh, something that takes care of the key that is used to partition, then this is fantastic. It's great and much faster than non-partition table. Things become a little bit more difficult if you insert data on a sparse table. In that case, 
performance are reduced compared to the standard table in general. Um, when we select data, when we use partition pruning, meaning that we can, uh, just, meaning that we can uh, uh, use the right partition because we because the optimizer can identify where to find the data. In that case, again, significant there is a significant improvement. You need to lock the table only if you are inserting uh, single records. If you are inserting with a, a buffer that inserts statement, you will do that. Right. So you refer to this part, right? Yes. Yeah. Because uh, as, as I was saying, on, on the other hand, if you have, if you have sparse inserts, uh, you, may have, uh, you may have some issues and uh, you can use a lock table. And uh, here I'm referring to an insert of single records on, uh, on many partitions. But as Giuseppe said, if you have a, 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 you know, a bulk of data, you can, you can use it. You don't need to lock the table and you are fine with the, with the performance. Uh, there are other aspects that must be considered, although uh, I would say it's, uh, it's weird, or it looks weird to me to use foreign keys uh, in, a, in a data warehousing environment. Some users do, but you don't have, uh, you don't have foreign keys, and you don't have spatial and, and full text indexes in, uh, in a partition. And uh, we don't have parallel selects on multiple partitions, so that's another important aspect to consider. But, just to give you an example of what we can do if we don't want or we cannot use uh, um, um, database partitioning, we, we can use application partitioning, meaning that we can create our own partitioning schema. Then usually we can implement something that is relatively simple using a partition mapping table where we have a partition here and a partition based table that refers to some specific tables that are partitioned here. And uh, a function, and I'm not saying that it must be a store procedure or a PHP function or whatever, I'm just saying in general, some a small piece of code that can identify the partition for you. So if the user sends a request on the fact that I need to know which table contains partition P1, then this function will look at the partition mapping table, will uh, write somewhere in a variable, in some, somewhere where I can find it, the name of the table. And then I can, of course, create uh, my select statement using that specific name. And then I can refer to that, uh, to that partition. And the result, of course, is a result set that comes only from the table I need and not for the whole set. And when we have, like, I don't know, two billion, three billion rows, that can be quite helpful. So just to make a typical example, uh, if we have uh, sales by, uh, in, uh, for year 2010 on January, February, March, and April, um, and these are the sales table, the fact tables with all the sales, our request can be, okay, I need to access the sales table, and I need to access sales in January. The result is uh, the fact that, of course, that function will find, will find that the table we need to access is sales uh, 2010-201001, and then we create the query with the concatenation of that, and then, of course, we prepare and execute the statement. And this can be, again, uh, it can be easily implemented within a tool that allows you to tweak the SQL statement. So you can effectively use this, uh, um, this idea of, the, of, of application partitioning with some reporting tools or BI tools as well. Some BI tools provide this out of the box. They have the same approach. They have their own tables on their own repository, but they use exactly the same approach just to bypass uh, the, the effect of a, a database partition. They prefer to use their own partition. Okay? And then, of course, you get results. Vertical partitioning. Okay, this is another aspect that, okay, you have to handle with care, meaning that, again, it's a guideline and it may be really handy in some cases, but not in all the cases. But you can have a fantastic effect in performance if you reduce the number of rows uh, in the fact table, in one fact table, by splitting this table in two 
in two fact tables, one primary and one secondary. So on the primary fact table, we will be focused on the joints with all the keys from the dimensions. And perhaps you may use uh, some fact rows, uh, the most important ones. If you have more fact rows, they can be stored on the secondary fact table. And there is just a one-to-one -one relationship between the two tables. Again, we improved, we have improved here the use of, uh, of caching. And uh, with the use of multiple SQL, we just retrieve information we store in, in a temporary table, this data, and then we retrieve uh, uh, more data from the secondary table with the next step of SQL. It's not always possible, but when it's possible, it's really, really helpful. So the other aspect here, something that is limited in database partitioning is the fact that these two tables can have different storage engines. You may have some large objects in the secondary fact and they can be on, a, on, a, on, a, on an archive engine. The archive engine can be accessed uh, through an index which is a primary key only. So again, being a one-to-one -one relationship between the secondary and primary fact table, this is fine or you can access for a sequential scan and then it will be fast as well. On query cache, I think you, you all know how query cache works, right? Yes? Sorry, I have a question about yeah. partitioning. Yes? Um, seems like if I use the index on the key column, it's almost like performance-wise it's not the same as partition table, but is there any Well, I, I would say that uh, the difference comes when you have uh, a huge number of rows, and then uh, uh, the, the table becomes really, really large, really huge. You don't notice a difference if you have like uh, a few rows, a few million rows, I would say, but then when the rows become like a billion, then you will, you will notice the difference. And if you have, a, if you have access through an index, uh, then again, it depends, but in general, you may, you may go away with you know, pretty easily. But if you have access uh, through a, a large number of rows, even through the index, then you will notice a significant difference. Okay? Right, uh, as I was saying on the query cache, uh, just as a quick reminder, the query cache stands just between your application and, uh, and nothing else. The query cache is there. So once you, once you send a, a, a select statement, uh, you, you first check the query cache, and uh, within the query cache, you can find the result set as it stands, as, as, you, are, as you expect. You don't need to pass the, optimi the parser, the optimizer, no. Okay? So it's fantastic. And uh, actually, some commercial databases have uh, implemented a sort of query cache in their latest versions when we have query cache since, uh, I don't remember to be honest, <laughs> but long, long time. Um, so the query cache is fantastic for uh, data warehousing and really, really fantastic when, you, when we have to store lookups. Like uh, we know that uh, most of the reports and queries we are executing will have some conditions, some specific conditions. Right, we don't need to, we don't need to run, uh, run them uh, all the times. I mean, we have, we have already done in query cache, and we can pre-warn the query cache just by executing um, these queries soon after the loading phase. So, in a typical warehousing environment where we have again ETL, and then once we have loaded the data, we can certify that from now on we can access the data warehouse. The query cache is just perfect because uh, uh, it will not go away very quickly. Remember. Query cache can be invalidated uh, by anything that is modified in one of the tables uh, within the result set that is stored in the, query, in, the, in the query cache. But in a data warehousing environment, first we load data and then we usually read. So we do not invalidate data and the query cache will be very, very helpful. Even better with multipass SQL. Um, we may define we may define a relatively small um, size and, uh, and that we can define a limit in the, the size of the result set we store in the query cache. That's another aspect. 
we can we can also consider that another aspect of caching is related to the use of man cache D. And, and, and okay, first of all, let's identify man cache D as a as a caching mechanism, and then the, let's see a comparison between the two, between carry cache and man cache D. So in this case, um, this is a, an aspect that must be handled at an application level. We don't have anything automatic that stores data in, a, in, a, in the memcached server. But uh, in the way we can do it, it's just fantastic. We can first check if data is, if we have a select query, OK? We have a select statement. Uh, first, we check on the memcached server. And if uh, the query is there, done, immediately available. Otherwise, we retrieve data from the data warehouse server. And, uh, and once we have the data on the data warehouse server, from the data warehouse server, we also store it into the memcached for the next uh, for the next user. So that's something that must be handled manually. But again, uh, we can implement it with uh, literally few SQL statements here. And of course, uh, the ETL phase will invalidate the memcached completely or almost completely, depending on the project, because uh, because in this case. Uh, of course, we are going to change the content of the data warehouse server. Now, if we if we want to store man, uh, uh, queries in the main cache this server, what we have to do is just to create, you know, a hash key specifically for the for the query, like uh, we're using, for example, an MD5 function. We take this as a key, and then we store the result set, and uh, that becomes a sort of uh, distributed query cache that is available for all the servers. And memcached can be very, very helpful when we have uh, when we have multiple servers, maybe replicated data, because we have a, a distributed environment that can be accessible through all the servers. Um, so just to give you a comparison, a quick comparison between query cache and memcached D, um, with the query cache, of course, the cache is MySQL only. It resides within the server. Um, the memcached can be accessed by any application. Um, again, in the, the query cache is only available only for one MySQL daemon. And if you need, uh, if you may have multi, uh, you know, replicated data on multiple MySQL D servers because there are, they, we have executed the same queries. And, uh, and it's transparent to the applications, and the invalidation is automatic. Now, this is the main problem because, of course, memcached doesn't have. Uh, automatic invalidation, it must be invalidated, uh, invalidated manually, and uh, it's application specific. We need to call and, and we need to call the query cache and retrieve the data. <coughs> With replication, uh, we may create uh, a quite interesting environment, um, generally speaking, when uh, when uh, the, the, the size of our data is not uh, is not that huge. It's not a huge warehouse. We are referring to a relatively small warehouse, considering the current uh, meaning of huge. So we are not talking about terabytes of data, but several gigabytes or hundreds of gigabytes. Um, and here, we can create a sort of sharding approach using some of the parameters that uh, can influence the use of replication with the replicate to the table or 2db, where basically we say you can replicate on this lane, you can replicate only these tables on only these databases and these schemas, or you can ignore these tables and these schemas. At that point, of course, the application or your uh, reporting system must be aware of what it can find on one on one slave or on the other. But that, that becomes quite helpful, as I said, if you have a, a large set of data. Um, one thing to remember is that replication may not be the, the best approach and the fastest to, um, to perform a bulk update. So if you are loading lots of data every day, for example, replication may not be the best solution because uh, you can just move the data and then load it uh, and that would be, would be sometimes helpful and better. So we can have a few scenarios here. One is the fact that you can just distribute data and balance all the slaves uh, to, um, against, uh, against these slaves. So that will be a real load balancing for all the queries. Um, 
But other quite interesting scenarios using replication can be the, the ones where we, have, we can have a continuous analysis, meaning that uh, you may have some rotating servers. So whilst you use uh, one server for queries, the other server can be constantly updated. And then you can define some checkpoints where you, um, you switch the query server and the updating server constantly. And that is a quite useful approach, of course. The other scenario that you may consider with replication is the one with uh, delayed snapshots, where you set up replication that can be, one of them can be in real time, one's late, another's late that can be 10 minutes behind or 30 minutes behind, blah, 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 and down to the, the previous day. So in this way, you can have some interesting analysis that are specifically on uh, data that are, of course, time-based here, and, uh, and you can see how they proceed. So, uh, as I said, replication can be pretty helpful in this case. All right? And finally, on sharding, um, we have, uh, we can use, again, the typical approach of sharding that we have with, uh, with uh, the classic web applications. And uh, we, can have, uh, we can have sharding where the fact tables, so we replicate all the um, lookup tables, for example, and we have different fact tables containing data for, let's say, for example, sales data for uh, a specific month um, during the year. And we can, of course, spread these uh, and split them on all the servers we have uh, in, um, in the sharding approach. And we can, of course, include the fact that they can be also replicated within the shard. But this is, let's say, less, um, it's something that we don't see that often uh, um, in the field. I mentioned active active servers. Have you ever seen this uh, implementation? Do you know that? Do you know that with uh, MyISA, you can have a shared storage, and you can have multiple MySQL servers, uh, and they access the same data directory, meaning the same data. Okay, this is quite a nasty implementation if you have an OTP application because you have table level locking and you rely on uh, external locking, on the file system locking, so it's not that good. But when you have data warehousing, where you have uh, first you have a loading phase, and if you are able to define the loads at the table level, you can first of all identify parallel loading from the different multiple. MySQL servers there, and when you read the data, you can read data uh, from the same source here. Of course, you have to be careful that your shared storage, share storage is powerful enough and it's not the bottleneck. Um, and uh, but you can get, you can be served by all these servers. They have, of course, their own caching, and they can uh, they can be well a sort of Oracle rack for data warehousing in this case. Okay. Okay, now, just, uh, uh, just to finish on the last five minutes, uh, um, a little, okay, you can't read that well, but uh, um, a few comments on benchmarks. Uh, you may have seen on, uh, on the internet, on some blogs, some benchmarks related to the use of MySQL and data warehouse. Um, I, refer so, I refer also to some of them here. Um, the comments are mainly on one point, Benchmarks, of course, are designed to measure performance, uh, but mainly on hardware and database software for basic operations. But sometimes they do not reflect the complexity of an advanced business intelligence solution. And that is the main point. If, you, if this benchmark does not really reflect what you need, that I think is meaningless. And that's the main point. So if you look at the TCPH benchmark and uh, there is another, uh, sorry, it's not SSC, it's SSB, the star schema benchmark. Uh, you can have a look at them and you can find that the TCPH, which is of course quite famous, has only seven tables and has a, an OTP design. So my question is, does it really matter if we are going to have a denormalized model? I don't think so, personally. I don't think it reflects what I need. So this benchmark, benchmark is designed to show how good some hardware is and some databases are in general. But 
they do not reflect uh, the typical modeling of the MySQL data in the house. That's a big problem. SSB is a little bit better. Even if it's, it's called the star schema, it is, okay, um, as I said, not perfect for MySQL, but at least it doesn't have an OTP design, which is, as I said, better than nothing. So, what's your real need? You need something, and this is a, a, an example of, a, of the queries that you can find in this benchmark. You find the aggregate profit by year, nation, and product, okay. That's a pretty neat query, and sometimes you may, you may need that, but at least based on my experience, uh, customers want something more, like uh, you want revenue growth, units sold, for example, revenue per unit, blah, 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 and uh, they need uh, more complex queries. So, for example, instead of having a query with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six joints, or five joints, sorry, and uh, all the, those conditions, you make something like, again, the use of a multipass SQL, a temporary query. This is still pretty complex, uh, but you may, you may look at that and you may find out that uh, uh, they're all basically um, through indexes and, uh, and the execution is much uh, faster. And then you have multiple temporary tables. You collect the data and you put, oops, and you finally present it uh, all combined. Okay, um, these are two different, uh, these are two different uh, queries. But what I'm saying, my point here is that uh, you may end up doing some tests on the TCPH benchmark, on some benchmarks like this, but your real needs are more and more complicated than that. So real needs may be things like, or, or you may think, oh, but I don't need that much. Right, but if you, if you look for a, a data warehousing benchmark, you may wonder, okay, don't I need uh, a current year, last year analysis, for example, so I want to see, uh, like, uh, I don't know, the sales, uh, if we are talking about an e-commerce website, or uh, the number of visits, if we are talking about a website, uh, this month compared compare to last month, uh, last month compared to the previous month, for example, or something like that or a month-to-date analysis, don't I know? I, I need that. I think, uh, I think these are some of the most common things. Or uh, the fact that I want to analyze an attribute and I want to analyze it as a minimum value, maximum value, or average. And all of these end up with a, a very complex query or just some simple multi-pass multi SQL, so multiple statements that can be then combined together. Not to mention the fact that we, if we go on and we look for contributions or market basket analysis, again, that might be quite helpful for, uh, for a common solution so, uh, when we need to find affinity products. Uh, that, that, that becomes fairly complex, fairly complicated. And the nightmare is here, when we have some time-based analysis. And like, let's say that we have some product categories, you move data, and you want to analyze changes as it is now compared to as it was some, let's say, a month ago, and you want to analyze the different categories. So to summarize, um, you can find some benchmarks on, uh, you, you may know the uh, MySQL Performance blog, uh, uh, and uh, there are some very good benchmarks on the, the Star Schema benchmark, and you can compare the different uh, the different um, um, columnar engines. Uh, we are going on with some tests. I cannot provide you some, uh, I cannot provide the values because we haven't finished yet. But just to give you an idea, um, the first query of the SSB benchmark with Infobright uh, took something like 24 minute, minutes to execute. Uh, we did the same test on, uh, on uh, a compact so it's a compressed MyEyesan table, and it took something like nine minutes. So there is a difference if you can, uh, if you can actually use uh, the right approach. The, only, the main difference was the fact that we have applied application partitioning there. Okay? I, will, I mean, we are going to blog about that. You can find more information here on, this, uh, on, this, um, um, on my blog and on a specific, on a specific website that is empty at the moment, so you have to stay tuned, but uh, there will be more information soon. OK. 
Okay. Okay, this is the standard uh, Oracle uh, um, description of the fact that uh, well, you can read it. Basically, yes. Okay. So your presentation is going to be online? Uh, Sorry? The presentation will be online. The presentation is already online, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we are already, yeah, two minutes past the hour. But if you have any question, perhaps while um, uh, Giuseppe is uh, setting things up here, I'm happy to take it.